Welcome to OHSU Talk Shorts. I'm Colin Prather, emergency medicine resident at OHSU. Today we'll be discussing North American venomous snakes. There are two main families of venomous snakes in North America. The first and much larger family are the crotalids, commonly called pit vipers. The three main members of this family are rattlesnakes, cottonmouths, or water moccasins, and copperheads. The second family of North American venomous snake is the elapids, or coral snakes. Coral snakes are implicated in a much smaller number of annual poisonous snake bites compared with the pit vipers. There are three species of coral snake in North America, the Arizona coral snake, eastern coral snake, and Texas coral snake. Pit vipers can be identified based on their triangular heads and elliptical pupils. Additionally, pit vipers derive their name from a heat-sensing pit located behind their nostrils. Identification of coral snakes is determined by the color of rings along their body. These brightly colored snakes typically have easily identifiable red, yellow, and black bands along the length of their bodies. In the United States, coral snakes and the similarly colored non-venomous scarlet king snake are often confused. Coral and king snakes can be distinguished by their color and patterns. Whereas coral snakes have black snouts, king snakes have red snouts. Both species have red, yellow, and black rings, but in different sequences. The red and yellow rings touch in the coral snake, but are separated by black rings in king snakes. Red on yellow kills a fellow, red on black, venom lack. This general rule for identifying coral snakes does not apply to Mexican species, some of which may have different color patterns. Rattlesnakes are found throughout most of the United States, but encounters are most common in western and southern states. Cottonmouths and copperheads have more limited ranges within the U.S. Cottonmouths can be found in the southeast from Virginia to Texas, while copperheads' natural distribution is in the eastern states, from Massachusetts to Texas. The three species of coral snakes are found primarily in the southern and southeastern part of the U.S., in addition to Mexico. As their name implies, the Arizona coral snake's natural habitat is in Arizona and parts of New Mexico, whereas the Texas coral snake resides primarily in Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. The eastern coral snake can be found more widespread in the southern states. Estimates suggest that there are around 8,000 poisonous snake bites annually in the United States, the majority of which occur from the pit vipers. Coral snakes represent around only 2% of poisonous snake bites in the U.S. Of these bites, a very small minority result in death, usually less than 10 per year. Most snake bites occur in adult males in the summer months when snakes are active. Sadly, the majority of deaths from snake bites occur in children. Most victims are bitten on an extremity, although bites to the torso, face, and tongue also occur. Over half of reported bites occur when an individual is purposely handling a known venomous snake. Occasionally, people are envenomated after killing and decapitating a rattlesnake. It is important to note that if you are bitten by a pit viper or coral snake, it does not necessarily mean you are envenomated. Dry bites occur when a poisonous snake bites but does not release venom. The rates of dry bites differ from species to species. Pit viper bites typically result in injection of venom about 75% of the time. Approximately 25% of bites do not result in envenomation and are considered dry bites. A dry bite is usually identified by lack of local skin changes including swelling, redness, and pain around the bite site. So, what components of snake venom make it dangerous? This differs significantly between pit vipers and coral snakes. Pit viper venom is a complicated mixture of more than 50 identified proteins, macromolecules, and metals. The clinical effects of pit viper venom are primarily due to its cytotoxic and hemotoxic effects. Additionally, systemic and neurotoxic effects can occur. The cytotoxic effects of pit viper venom cause local tissue injury, usually centered around the bite site. Multiple components in venom cause endothelial and basement membrane damage, destruction of the extracellular matrix, and a subsequent inflammatory cascade. This results in pain, erythema, swelling, echomosis, blistering, and necrosis. More rarely, myotoxic components of the venom can result in local and systemic rhabdomyolysis. Local tissue damage usually begins around 30 and 60 minutes following envenomation. 
hematologic manifestations occur due to hypofibrinogenemia, thrombocytopenia, and coagulopathy with elevated prothrombin time. Platelets may be inhibited, activated, or aggregated by various venom components. Thrombin-like enzymes and fibrinolysins that cleave fibrinogen cause coagulopathy and hypofibrinogenemia. However, clinically significant massive hemorrhage is rare. Several species of rattlesnakes, most notably the Mojave rattlesnake, possess a toxin, the Mojave toxin, that prevents presynaptic release of acetylcholine. This can result in facial nerve dysfunction, weakness, and paralysis. Systemic symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis are common in all pit viper envenomations. In severe cases, shock, pulmonary edema, DIC, and cardiovascular collapse can occur. The clinical presentation following a pit viper bite can range from benign to life-threatening. As we discussed before, with a dry bite, fang marks may be seen, but there will be no local or systemic symptoms after 8 to 12 hours. With mild envenomation, the patient experiences local pain and edema, but no coagulation abnormalities. In moderately severe envenomations, there will be pain and edema, but coagulation abnormalities will also be present. In severe cases, shock, pulmonary edema, DIC, and cardiovascular collapse occur. Coral snake envenomation results in little to no local tissue damage or destruction. Instead, neurotoxic effects predominate, resulting in ptosis, cranial nerve dysfunction, weakness, dysphagia, respiratory failure, and occasionally death. The mechanism is due to postsynaptic acetylcholine blockade at the neuromuscular junction. In contrast to widely held beliefs among the general population, patients who receive a pit viper bite should not have a tourniquet applied to the wound, nor should the bite be suctioned or incised. Pre-hospital care should generally be limited to immobilization of the affected limb, placement of an intravenous catheter, and rapid transport to a medical facility. Patients who are volume depleted or vomiting should receive an IV fluid bolus. Basic labs, including coagulopathy panels, should be sent every six to eight hours. All victims of a rattlesnake bite, even those who are asymptomatic, should be observed for eight to 12 hours after the bite. Crofab is an antivenom approved by the FDA for treatment of pit viper envenomation. Indications for use include progressive local tissue damage, coagulopathy, or neurotoxic signs or symptoms. Six crofab vials should be mixed in 250 cc's of normal saline and infused at an initial rate of 25 to 50 cc's for the first 10 minutes. If no reactions to crofab are observed, this rate should be increased to 250 cc's per hour. If after six vials symptoms are still progressive, an additional four to six vials should be administered. Once local tissue symptoms have been maintained, a maintenance dose of two vials every six hours should be administered. This dosing regimen is the same for both pediatric and adult patients. Antibiotics are rarely indicated in pit viper bites as infection is quite rare. Tetanus prophylaxis should be administered if not up to date. Compartment syndrome can occur following pit viper envenomation but is very rare and cannot be reliably diagnosed without directly measuring compartment pressures. It is reasonable to attempt to treat elevated compartment pressures with antivenom initially, but clinical examination and compartment pressures should be closely followed. Fasciotomy is not routinely indicated. Patients who receive antivenom should be monitored for at least 24 hours after the last dose of antivenom and should be without signs of bleeding, systemic signs, or worsening coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia before discharge. Upon discharge, all patients who receive antivenom should be monitored as an outpatient for recurrent or delayed coagulopathy within two to three days of discharge, and again at five to seven days after last dose of antivenom with CBC with platelets, INR, PT, PTT, and fibrinogen levels. Patients may need physical therapy to get the affected bite site moving, to regain strength, and avoid contractures. Given the more limited number of coral snake bites in the U.S. annually, there is a less standardized approach to treatment. In general, patients with a history concerning for possible eastern or Texas coral snake bite should be observed for 24 hours in a monitored unit where resuscitative measures, including endotracheal intubation, can be performed. Since neuromuscular weakness and respiratory paralysis can develop quickly, endotracheal intubation should be considered at the first sign of bulbar paralysis. Traditionally, 
treatment with North American coral snake antivenom was recommended for all patients in whom there was a strong suspicion of coral snake bite, even in the absence of signs of envenomation. These recommendations were made because paralysis can develop quickly, as some data suggest decreased need for intubation. However, other data suggest no differences in intubation rates when antivenom is given prophylactically before symptoms onset. Currently, there is limited supply of coral snake antivenom as production ceased in 2006. In any case, the best course of action is to contact the Poison Control Center or a toxicologist for treatment guidance. Let's summarize. There are two main families of venomous snakes in North America, crotalids and elapids. Crotalid envenomations are the most common in the United States. Crotalids are also known as pit vipers because of their heat-sensing pits located behind their nostrils. Snakes in this group include rattlesnakes, cottonmouths, and copperheads. Crotalid venom contains a variety of cytotoxic chemicals with hemotoxic and neurotoxic effects. Signs and symptoms of envenomation include intense pain at the bite site with subsequent develop of edema, erythema, bola, and ecchymosis. Compartment syndrome can occur as well as coagulation abnormalities. In severe envenomations, hypotension, pulmonary edema, DIC, and cardiac collapse can occur. Treatment includes supporting the limb at heart level, large bore IV access with fluid hydration as needed, close monitoring of limb edema, and frequent lab monitoring, including CBCs, PT, PTT, fibrinogen, and CK. Limb edema should be monitored closely, and if progressive swelling occurs, Crofab should be administered at an initial dose of four to six vials. Repeat dosing may be required if there is ongoing progression of swelling. Fasciotomy is rarely necessary and should be done only after measurement and documentation of elevated compartment pressures that do not decrease with additional doses of antivenom treatment. Wound care, including cleaning, debridement, immobilization, and possibly delayed skin grafting, may be necessary. The venomous elapids in North America include three species of coral snakes. These represent a much smaller percentage of poisonous snake bites in the U.S. with fewer fatalities compared to the pit vipers. Coral snake venom is primarily neurotoxic due to postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor inhibition. Severe envenomation leads to diaphragmatic paralysis and respiratory failure. Treatment is primarily supportive. Close monitoring of the patient's respiratory status is paramount as intubation and mechanical ventilation may be required in the case of respiratory failure. Antivenom can be administered, however, there is limited availability as its production has been discontinued. Thanks for tuning in to OHSU Talks Shorts. See you next time.